Uh, I'm a scientist. I'm somebody who uses these new tools, and I'm like, let's say, somewhat Web 2.0, Science 2.0, Zavi. I like these things, and I'm just like, when I when I got in touch with Iad, we were at the same medical school. He came up with the idea of having a social network for scientists, and then I started to look into these things. What could the Web 2.0 mean for science, and what can we, how can we basically use the Web 2.0? And then at some point I basically hit the expression, the password science 2.0 and I would just basically point out that there are different conceptions of the password science 2.0. We just use it and with the understanding that it's web 2.0 together with science or web 2.0 for science but there are people that still try to use the term science 2.0 for different approaches to science at all. Okay, and I found a nice web page where you can see all these different conceptions of the word science 2.0. But we see science 2.0 as, as a kind of a revolution. And as all revolutions provide great opportunities and great dangers. And the question is in which direction we will drive this revolution. This revolution of the combination of web 2.0 together with science, which we use the word science 2.0. We all know that Web 2.0 has influenced our, our, li our whole lives. We have social networks, some people use them more or less. We have some crowdsourcing, shopping applications, some news feeds that are constructed according to our tastes and dislikes. And these things are even in the beginning of influencing our daily life. But not so much within science, unfortunately. And so why is this that we don't use all the, all the tools and features that are available in the web 2.0 for science? It's actually a question. So at some point we have a legacy gap. Uh, uh, something, we have, a, we have a gap between the availability of novel tools that the web 2.0 provides for us and the adaptation within science. A good example, you already mentioned it with other words, is publishing, scientific publishing. So long since we use um, blog posts, tweets and everything for normal news feeds, personal publications and these things, but within science Blog posts, wiki updates spiel, uh, play still a little role. And why is this? Why is this? Why, why aren't scientists just use blogs and wikis like other people use it for publishing, like the media? The whole journalists um, learn to understand how to use these tools. So why is this difference between the availability and the features that are available within science? And I just call this difference the legacy gap. Uh, and when I start thinking about it and communicating with other people, I realize that in science we can't see just like we can't we can't apply all the rules that, that count to normal publishing or other publishing as as we if, if as we would like to do it because in science all things like somewhat uh, interconnected. So a scientist can't just publish his news results in a blog post because then he would lose his ability to publish it as a novelty in a in an accepted paper. And on the other hand side, you just can't change um, all the paper systems into blocks because then you can't you, the impact factors don't apply for this paper anymore because it's a different concept. And when I start to think about this, so to realize and to make all the features that are available in the web 2.0 available for scientists, we have to we have to we have to see the whole thing of science 2.0 together. We have to make different pillars. I identified four pillars that we have to realize more or more or more or less simultaneously so that all the features become available to the scientists of the web 2.0. So it's an involved cultural, political and structural processes transition towards science 2.0. We can't just have tell the scientists to publish your results in blog posts when on the other hand side he doesn't get impact factor and credits for it. Okay? 
So we have to have four concepts realized to make the Web 2.0 available for scientists. First, we have to, maybe this is one of the easiest pillars, we have to have a unique research identifier, a mean of identifying a researcher. So one of the biggest problems, and maybe uh, Dr. Madish can talk about this, is to identify an author of a paper and to list all his publications together in the database. So there should be a concept or a number or something so that the researcher can be identified, his identity in the online web, in the online space. Okay, he could sign tweets, blog posts, his publications, this is unique researcher identifier. And on the second concept is a researcher should have a kind of an online profile. That means a home base where all these things of this researcher, scientist, his credibility comes together like an online profile. It can be a web page, it can be a page in a social network. And then we have more thought-provoking things. These are the new publication concepts. We can, today we have static concepts, static, con uh, static publication concepts. That means we, we publish a paper and then we don't change it anymore. If we have new results, we just publish another paper. In Wikipedia, imagine we, we can just update the wiki page, okay? And then we have open data concept, meaning that you can just publish your research results and then um, have other researchers work with it. So these are publication formats that are far beyond we just publish a paper concept. And the last but not least, we have we have to have new impact measurements, meaning we have to we have to account a blog post, a useful blog post that other people might cite for the credibility of a scientist, for the success of a scientist, so that he can even feel free to publish his results in, in form of blog posts and not only at full papers. Okay? So, if we, if we look a little bit more into the publication concept at the moment, we have we have publications within science that range from, let's say, a book, then we have a review, a paper, and maybe a talk or abstract. So we have different levels of publications. Um, the later I am, I am in a project, the more finished my resu uh, results are, the more I tend to publish it as a paper. In the beginning, I publish it as an abstract. If I'm advanced in my career, I write a review, and later on, I maybe write a book. Six. So a book contains the most, let's say, complete results, and it addresses a broad audience, while an abstract um, addresses a very small audience. But the Web 2.0 added some new features to this list. Yeah, so we don't have to have abstracts being the, let's say, smallest publication form. We can have uh, scientists publish their results as just comments in some news feed streams or at blog posts, or just a status update in a in a tweet, uh, just an idea, a small glimpse of an idea, a microblog feature. There's no fundamental reason beyond the legacy gap or the cultural cultural reasons that prevent us from using these new publications forms that could make up Science 2.0. And okay, this was like. So, if we look at Science 1.0 in the schematic, without this new publications form, we have a long time in a project where scientists can't communicate with this environment, with his fellow scientists, without his not trusted open scientists, doing the idea on concept fairs, doing the research phase, because he's, he might always be afraid that they steal his ideas, publish them before him, and he can't get his ideas published or his research results in a credited way. So only in the end of a, of a project, he might be able to publish his results as a standard paper, or maybe as a review, as a talk of, on a conference. Imagine the project comes to an halt. It stops because something breaks, something they run out of money, and something you basically lost all the ideas, lost the knowledge, and lost of the data in the today's science world. You don't even bother writing a paper. Okay? So it's all gone. Other, other scientists might be able to build on this false data. So Edison said that um, like failures of, of experiments are as important as successful experiments. Okay? 
So within Science 2.0, this changes because a scientist is in the, in the most comfortable situation to publish every little research, every little result, every little idea to the world because his name and his, his impact, so to say, is associated for us. And he can, he can in ver very early stages of his project, he can communicate with other researchers, he can write a blog post because he's known his, his name is associated with his blog post and he will be able to refer to it. This is all given if all the assumptions of Science 2.0 are fulfilled, that you have impact factor associated with it. He might write, a, imagine he just starts a project, has a good idea, tweets it in the evening, the next day he writes a grant application, starts his project, like his first results, he just posts a blog post to small communities of fellow scientists that work in the same area, he gets some ideas from them, and later he can write a full paper and with, with, with referencing his earlier tweets. So he can like follow everything. I'm not saying that papers or book or book chapters become uh, uh, will, be, will, will not be used in the future of science. They will be just one end of the publication chain, okay? So we have these two pictures and I found this tweet interesting, so let's make this decade, 2010. It was, it was tweeted on the 1st January of 2010. Let's make this the decade of science 2.0 and address all these changes that we just, to the best of science and so to the best of the whole society. Thank you very much for Well, thank you for yep. the ideas. Yeah.